Hey everyone, it's Lisa with Are You My Cousin? And as you can see, I have Jen Baldwin with uh, Find My Past with me today. Hey Jen, how are you doing? I'm doing so well, Lisa, thanks so much. Oh good, I'm so glad you could join me. So guys, you may notice this looks a little different because Jen and I are um, doing obviously a co-presentation here, but we are, um, broadcasting on Find My Past live, as well as on the Are You My Cousin Facebook and YouTube sites as well. So we're really covering covering our bases today. So um, I want to welcome everyone. If you are um, new to Are You My Cousin, if you are, um, I am Lisa Listen, and I blog over at are You My Cousin, where you can learn, I blog about all things genealogy, basically. I try to take the overwhelm out of genealogy research. And one of the things that I hear a lot from my readers is that they struggle with Irish research. And, and to be honest, so do I. <laughs> and, I <laughs> and, and it is not an area of my expertise. So when that happens, I know where to go, actually. I, I do know where to go find help. So that's when I reached out to Jan and said, hey, um, hey, what do you think? Can you help us out? Because there's so many of us who um, are struggling with that. And I think we as North American uh, researchers, as many of, not all, but a lot of my readers are, um, struggle with that because here we are in the US trying to research those Irish ancestors back in Ireland. And so Jen is gonna help us out with that today. Um, I guess before I get too far, let me just make sure to, Full disclosure, guys, I am an affiliate for Find My Past. And so I just want to make that um, a full disclosure there. Oh, wow. Look at everybody coming in. I hey, know. Aaron, so I recognize you guys. Um, Flo, there's Claire from Australia. Yay. Hey, Victoria. It's, isn't it like four o'clock in the morning in Australia? <laughs> it's got to be something crazy like that. Wow. Look at everybody. So we, and our, we have Celia from Argentina. We have Julie from Hilton Head, South Carolina. Yay, it's probably a beautiful day at the beach there today. Um, wow, we have folks from everywhere. I can't keep up, it's just all flying past. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Vicky's in and, Florida. Uh, I'm gonna read out hey, some of these too. Yeah, We've got yeah. uh, Linda's in Lancashire. That's so good. Susan's in Portland. Georgia's up in Essex. Over in Essex, I should say. Sorry, not up in Essex. So. <laughs> uh, Phillips in North Wales. Nikki's in the UK. Let's see, Erie, Pennsylvania. Oh, wait, that's Lee and Kath, Kathy from Cincinnati, which is a little bit weird because one of my family lines goes from Erie, Pennsylvania to Cincinnati in their migration oh, route. Wow. So, and they were right next to each other in the comments thread. <laughs> yep, oh, we've got more Pennsylvania. We have, uh, oh, Ray is also from Australia. Um, oh my gosh, we have, Kim in Dorset, the UK. I have to be honest, my, my geography for the UK is not great when it comes from these towns. So I'm not going to say up there or, or out there. <laughs> we have all, Australia up. Oh, we have some, Marie is another person from Hilton Head Island. Yay. Oh, hey, Chris from Wisconsin. Um, Iowa, Des Moines, Iowa. You know, guys, I went to Iowa for the very first time about a year ago. I guess it was 2019. I drove out there with myself. It was, it was really fun to drive that into that part of the US. I hadn't been there. So yay. Oh, we have Lynn from Northern Ireland. Is it, oh, I just loop out me. North Ireland. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I saw that one too. And I saw a comment about something about my bandwidth. I will try to investigate that as I go. But it, um, Ellie's in the comments with us for those of you on the Find My Past side of the family today. So everybody say hi to Ellie. Um, and I will ask her to watch out for that for me so I she can keep me aware if I have issues on my my live stream. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. All right. So we are here to talk about Irish ancestors. I actually have done, you know, um, I have a lot of Scots Irish, but I have a, a, a real, one really strong Irish line. And um, obviously it's my brick. Wall. It's my brick wall line. <laughs> but um, yeah, why? You know, I have so many readers who come to me and say in that, you know, I'm really stuck on my Irish ancestry. Um, you know, what kind of tips do you have? Why, why is Irish research, why is it so hard? Well, you know, one of the biggest reasons why Irish research is so hard is because Ireland has had a lot of record loss. Um, and that really can be almost entirely rooted back to 1922 when the public records office in Dublin um, was destroyed by fire and the majority of the 19th century census records were lost at that time. Um, there also was no 1921 census taken because of the Irish Civil War. Um, 
And then um, there were a couple of census years that were actually destroyed by bureaucratic error as well. So they were literally pulped into paper during the First World War um, because they thought there were copies out there and there weren't. So um, we have a huge loss of kind of the backbone of genealogy, right? Records, right? The census is gone. Um, oh, and thank you, Ellie. That was yeah. candy. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to click that button. Ellie's on it. So when you look at you know, the, the backbone of genealogy for most of us is the national census. And um, so very little of those early years actually survive. Um, um, a lot of the, just, there we go, that looks a little bit better. And then um, the more modern ones, right? And especially the ones right after the famine and right during and after the American Civil War, when we need those kinds of records, um, when you have so much migration into North America, the, the census just doesn't exist. Um, so that large Irish immigration wave um, happens, you know, late eight, 1800s into the turn of the century, and you don't get a full census in Ireland until 1901. It's the first surviving census. Wow, I didn't, I did not realize. I knew there was a, a tremendous amount of destruction. I did not realize there had been quite that much. Right. So, it's pretty, wow. it was pretty severe. So the picture in the background, if you guys can see that, I know it's a little faded, but that is actually a picture of the fire itself. Um, and if I move one more here, record loss from that fire was really extensive. It wasn't just the census records. 50% of the Church of Ireland parish registers were also lost. Um, and we lost everything before 1858 in the original wills, administration bonds, and marriage bonds categories. Um, so combine that with the fact that Ireland did not start civil registration for the entire population until 1864, which is quite late, especially for the British Isles. Um, and you have this kind of, you know, massive amount of very minimal records, right? Everything kind of adds up to this, this issue of just, there are no records. The, the sense, the national collections just simply don't exist. Wow. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty intense, intense, right? <laughs> when you actually break it down that way, it's like, oh, wow, there, there's, yes, a lot more loss than, than we realize. Or we realize, you recognize what you're missing, I guess, basically. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. but all is not lost complete. Well, I shouldn't say all hope is not lost. So all hope is not lost. You're right. All you're right. So let me, let me go back to this, actually, because in the 1821, 31, 41, and 51, there are still some fragments. Mm -hmm. um, so if you happen to have ancestors in those areas, then you, you know, it's definitely worth checking. There's also other um, materials like, you know, that at one point there was a pension offered um, and they did a census um, search a form. So they would have to fill out this form in order to get this pension. And that can be used as a really good census substitute as well. Um, so um, what you have is fragments to look at, which are available to search on Find My Past for free. And then the 1901 and, and 1911 are also available to search online for free. Um, and it is, um, and then the next one, sorry, that's what I was going to say, is 1926. And that will be released in about five years. Is They're scheduled to release that in, in 2026. Are they, are they on the, you know, I know the U.S. Census is, it's 72 years after the creation. Is it? I haven't done the math there to see. Yeah. <laughs> what it um, in, in the British Isles, the uh, security rule is usually 100 years. Okay. So 100 years for just, so just assume it's 100 years for, for all of Britain, Ireland, Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Well, so what do we do? <laughs> what do we what do? Do, we do? What do we you do know, here? Um, um, yeah. I mean, you know, how do you, how, what is our first step? What, what do we do for research? If we've got, we realize we have this Irish line, what do we do? Right. And, and so the question becomes, is Irish research actually impossible? Uh, and the answer is no, you know, absolutely not. Now, um, a lot of what I do, obviously, is very focused on North America. So for those of you in the UK, some of what we're going to talk about may not seem as helpful to you. But um, I strongly suggest that you follow the practices anyway, because you may pick up something, even from a collateral cousin or branch of your family that went over to America if it's not directly related to the person that you're researching, you may actually learn something about them anyway, right? So my first suggestion actually for everybody when it comes to Irish research um, is 
that we actually, we have to start here in the US or in Canada, right? Um, so when it comes to reasonably exhaustive research and following good genealogical methodology, that's actually really important in the case of Irish research. Um, so spend a considerable amount of time exploring their fan club, friends, associates, and neighbors. Utilize the community, right? We're all right now on a live session talking about Irish research. So in theory, every single person involved today is interested in Irish ancestry. So connect with the people that you see on the YouTube channel or on the Facebook group and actually just talk to them and find out what what they know, right? The um, Find My Past has a wonderful platform for that, the Find My Past forum group on Facebook. Um, Lisa, I know you have platforms for that and mm -hmm. you talk a lot about research methodology. So maybe you wanna throw in a couple of sentences here. Sure, sure. Um, absolutely. I think I, the point that you have, the very first point that you have is conducting the most exhaustive research here in North America, because that's before you can really cross over back into Ireland or really any, if you're any immigrant ancestor research, you really have to um, research all their records here. And I mean, really get into their heads, everything. Yeah. When you're trying to figure out where they came from, or, you know, I look at everything from all of the records, I look at where they went to church. I look at what community, what types of civic organizations they might have been in, because that could be a clue um, back to what maybe their family was part of that type of um, the, that type of social reform in their their home country. I'll even look at foods because maybe there's a certain food that is very local, specific to a local area in a country, and I want. And if that's what my family's been doing, then I need to start looking in that direction as well. Right. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You really want to get in their heads. You want to, yep. you want to think like they think what was important to them, because if it was important to that ancestor here in America, it was probably important to them back in their home country. Right. And so Tess asked a really great question. How do you investigate the fan, the friends, associates, and neighbors? For neighbors, you can see them in the census, but what type of records would show their friends or associates? And um, when it comes to um, really anybody, but I, you know, one of my particular interests is in fraternal societies or friendly societies in the mm -hmm. UK. And that is particularly true with Irish Americans. Um, I, the Irish brought their religion with them. They did not convert, right? If, if you think about someone in the UK, you might see them move from the Church of England into a different denomination here in the States. Mm -hmm. um, but the Irish uh, population, generally speaking, was either Catholic or Protestant. And you have some pockets of other populations, right? There's a decent population of Quakers, for example. But for the most part, when they migrated over, you can say either Protestant or Catholic. So when they get to the US, they start joining organizations like the Irish Sons, um, you know, the Benevolent Brotherhood of Irish Sons or the Irish Irish daughters or um, uh, fraternal orders, other fraternal orders, and um, uh, Knights of Pythias or um, the Catholic foresters, for example, um, they all have their kind of community to work through. And when you're looking at the fan club, that kind of relationship can be really important because you're talking about people that they socialize with, but also people that they go to church with, that mm -hmm. they um, that they do business with, um, people that might have similar political beliefs as they do, and all of those provide routes for research. Um, to Lisa's point about kind of getting in their heads, I like to use the expression of know where they buy their shoes. If you can tell me where an ancestor actually got his boots, then I will tell you that you've done exhaustive research. Now, I have never actually been able to answer that question for myself, um, <laughs> and it is an Kind of an extreme example right but but the point i'm trying to make is that if you know literally every little detail about their lives then you have done exhaustive research if you can't answer that question then you're not quite there yet and you can still do that uk research alongside but understand that there's still more possibilities of of learning and exploring in the united states absolutely and because and, and kind of to build on that too is like i'll say you know if your ancestor were to knock on your door can you would, you know, I want you to know them so well, you would recognize them. And it's the same thing in the records. So that if you are, you know, trying to find where they bought their shoes, if you're, if you're researching and you're into, you know, 
a land record or a deed record here in America, you know, would you actually recognize them and be able to pick them out from somebody of the same name because you right. want to recognize their movements and right. those kinds of things. So, yeah. Yep, absolutely. Um, so for me, one of the key things, especially when it comes to Irish research, right, because Irish research has certainly this reputation of being really, really difficult. And that can be true. So for me, a positive mindset is really important right? I, I actually don't think about my brick walls. I don't like using that term. I don't like, even like saying that I have a brick wall. I have an opportunity to learn more. And it's, it's just vocabulary, right? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, but it helps keep my mindset in the place where I need it to be. I need to be thinking about what else can I learn? What else do I not know? What other questions can I ask? What's my strategy? And how's my strategy going to evolve based on what I learned today and what I, what, what questions I'm still trying to answer. That I love that. Okay. Because I have, I do tend to use the term brick walls. Definitely. <laughs> I love that. It's, Everybody an does. <laughs> it's an opportunity to learn more and, and you're absolutely right. I, I so I'm going to start changing up just fair warning, everyone. I'm going to start changing up my um, terminology. <laughs> so be aware. There we go. That's perfect. So when I think about my mindset, I think about my education, right, which never stops. Um, and again, we're on this session together so that, you know, I, I can share information, but also so that I can learn. Every time I, I have one of these chats with Lisa, I learn something from her and I learn from the comments from all of you who are watching. No one gets to know everything in the world. So we're all, we, you know, we all have to work together to share that knowledge. Um, I definitely want to think about communication in my research plan and how I'm collaborating with other researchers and, and librarians and archivists and specialists and historians, all of the people in the genealogy community, which in, in actual fact is quite big, right? Um, on I'm trying to remember, is it one of the social media platforms? I follow the archivist for Levi Jeans. Hmm. And I, I never really thought about it before, but when you think about you know, your your farming ancestors or turn of the century when Levi's kind of came out and jeans became a thing, that was a really big, you know, had a major impact on the world of work. And so their influence as a brand mattered to my ancestors. Oh, wow. I never thought about that. Okay, I'm writing that down. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, so I, and I, I don't even remember how I stumbled across any of that. But you know, there's a there's a beer historian out at the Oregon State University who is on really active on Twitter, and she runs the Beer Archive at OSU. Um, so I follow her just because I think you know that's the stuff that our ancestors, you know, they they bought beer too, right? Like, mm -hmm. so um, when we talk about that, that kind of that concept of doing that exhaustive research, those are the people that I'm looking to for those creative um, research opportunities. Okay, that that is a really fascinating. I, you know, I, I've never taken it to that level, but yes, I will absolutely. Of course, I don't know if there's an archivist for moonshiners, but that, that I, bet you there is. I, I bet, I bet you there is. I bet there is. Um, so when you think about, you know, taking the approach to research with kind of a, a positive mindset. You want to think about your education, your communication, but also, you know, creative records, right? Which is kind of what I was just talking about and thinking about things like the fraternal societies and religious organizations and religious publications, right? Have you looked at the, the religious newspapers that are available, that are digitized and available on Find My Past, right? That might be an answer for you. Um, Doc license registers is one of my favorite examples. And, um, you know, and when it comes to Irish research, companies like Find My Past or organizations like Family Search, we really have to get creative in what we publish, what we make available to researchers. Um, so in terms of, you know, digitizing Irish records, those are the kinds of things that we're really looking for is something unique and different, but still has that essential genealogy information of name, date, and place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. I love that you have the social histories there. Um, yes. <laughs> I, write, I write and speak on that a lot um, because that is something that, um, again, it's, it's, it's getting to know your ancestor at that at that level as Absolutely. when you talk about social history, you know, if it was important to the society and the community they lived in, it's important to you as, your, as a researcher. Absolutely. And it's important to learn about. So definitely. Yeah. 
Yep. So when it comes to creativity, I always um, I always like to remind people too that do not judge a book by its cover. And I have a great example of this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show I'm gonna talk through my example. So I found this book a couple of years ago, and it's actually on Find My Past. Um, it was published in 1877, and it's entitled My Notes are Over There: uh, The Irishman in Canada. Um, and I kind of went. I don't think that's going to be very relevant to me, but I flipped through the table of contents anyway. This was one of my first, <clears throat> excuse me, big lessons and making sure I looked at everything, right? So the first five chapters are actually all um, Irish history, um, Irish around the world, Irish immigration, religious topics, the famine. They don't even get to Canada, which is the title of the book, until the sixth chapter. Mm -hmm. So when you look at this, you kind of go, well, Irish in Canada, that's not really relevant, but in actual fact, it, it really is. So at the time I was researching this guy that I thought had ended up in California um, for the gold rush. And so I saw this chapter that mentioned California specifically, and I thought, okay, I better take a look, right? I'm not gonna overlook this one. And I find this one little snippet that says that a fourth of the farms in California are farmed by Irishmen. And one fourth of the population of San Francisco at the time of this publication, right? And that those couple of sentences has that extra citation. And it said, further research, refer to the Irish in America by John Francis McGuire. So, okay. So I go out and find that publication, which happens to be on Internet Archive. And it's massive. It's full of information. And so from here, I found records for the Hibernian Savings Bank and Loan Society. Um, I was able to find records for um, various organizations around the San Francisco area. I was able to find um, statistics and population that led me to additional government, you know, statistical reports for the area in California. It turns out he wasn't um, in the gold rush at all. He was a businessman in San Francisco. But if it weren't for this path, I would never, I don't think I would have discovered that. I certainly wouldn't have discovered it as quickly as I did, right? So I started with a book that seemed completely irrelevant and it led me down this path to a multitude of records that opened up a huge opportunity for me in terms of research. So when it comes to approaching your mindset and making sure that you're thinking about things in a big, broad way, this is kind of what I'm talking about. That is an amazing example. I <laughs> love, so I love that. And I love that, yeah, that you, you know, that you followed the path that when they, you, you thought outside of the box and, and, and went ahead and checked that, but then you also followed the, the next reference to, right. something. and I think sometimes we, we might not always do that. And I think that that's, but that's, look what that led you to. Yeah. Um, I sometimes will say, I'll look at those books, but it's usually the reference, sometimes the reference list or the bibliography in the back, that sometimes is actually more helpful to me yeah. than, um, than, than the actual book, or I'll actually read, say a biography maybe of a uh, a citizen in that area and then but what i'm really looking for is really what records they use so that then i can pull from those as well and check right, those out right i you know, and and i knew you would appreciate this cuz of your love yeah. for social history but um it's it, you know these authors had to get their information from somewhere too and so mm -hmm. even though this this book was published in the 1800s and it's you know it's public domain now and and some may look at this and go well it's not really good historical research because they were so biased at the time and that's really true right every author has a bias um it, it's still definitely worth looking at these publications and digging into those references and those citations. And as you mentioned, just, you know, their bibliography, where did they get their information? Because they had to get it from somewhere. Right. Right. And it's, unless it's, it's fiction. Bad. <laughs> right, right, and it's not fa it's not fast research, and we recognize that. But it's, right, yeah. it is that level of research that we you know you just have to kind of you know get into and go for it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I want to. I just noticed this comment come across. Actually, I'm going to just hang on a second. Let me let me do this, and then I'm going to put this. I hope this is okay, Deidre. She says, if anyone messages me here and I don't reply, it means I didn't see it. Feel free to message me because I'm researching O'Sullivan, Murphy, Hartman, and tons more. This is exactly what I'm talking about when I when I refer like using the community, reaching out to people. That's a great example. So thank you for making that comment and thank you for for watching. And thank you for for those of you who are connecting with each other. It's exactly what we want to see happen. 
Yeah, absolutely. And because we'll do the same thing. Like in the, I have an RU, my cousin community. So it's a Facebook yeah. group and that's right. exactly what folks do in there. And I mean, literally people have found cousins in there. Um, yeah, that's great. I found cousins <laughs> in there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so what's next up for us here? So, so as we as we've kind of gotten that positive mindset and we're moving forward, what's kind of the next step for us as researchers? I think one of the things that people should really be aware of, and I'm going to go ahead and put my slides back up, um, sure. is you know you aren't alone. Um, there are a, a variety of organizations and people out there that are trying to help you solve this Irish research question. Um, Find My Past actually did this a couple of years ago when we created this British and Irish Roots collection. Um, so, and, and I'll tell you a little story to go along with this. So what happened was we, we looked at all of the people who were trying to find records of immigration, right? And we looked at all the immigration records on the site and kind of calculated out if someone were to actually research in each one of those individual record sets, it would take hours to pour through all of the immigration records that we have on the site. Mm -hmm. So instead of making people do that, we built a bucket and that's what Irish and or British and Irish roots is. It's just a big giant bucket of records that have some source of immigration. So when you're looking like in this uh, example, I'm looking for Daniel McNamara, who's my ancestor. He came over around 1863. Um, and you see that the, the, data sets on the list, right, on the search results list are Ohio naturalizations, United States marriages, New Orleans and New York passenger list, New England naturalizations. So we took all of those record sets and put them into one big bucket. So you only have to search one place to mm -hmm. find a possible ancestor and their immigration, right? So all of these records will lead you into some kind of transcript. Um, and then and it gives you some information, gives you kind of the basics. And then it says, view the record source. And that takes you to the actual record outside the bucket now um, for, for that actual source. And then when you click on that, you get into another transcription. You can add it to your tree or um, you know, download the image if it's available or look at the original record. So there are a lot of people out there who are trying to help with this Irish American problem and fill in those gaps. So watch for these kind of, you know, sites like Find My Past to take, adva to take advantage of the data that they have and create new tools and new ways to work into that and, and find some of that origin information. Because location is key, right? When it comes to Irish research. If, right. if you know, if all you know is Ireland, you need to do more research, right? In, the, in North America, you need to try mm -hmm. and find at least a county. Um, if, you, if you can't get to county level, it's going to be really difficult. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was noticing too on the right hand side where it gives possible suggestions of, yeah. is this the same person? I was really kind of looking at all the, just the variety of um, records there as well. Like the, the one at the bottom is met metal rolls and honors records. I just thought that right. was really interesting. You know, again, just kind of speaking to some of those um, types of records that could be out there that that maybe we're not thinking about. So yeah, yeah. that's really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So let's, let's, that's a perfect segue. Lisa, you're really good at that. Um, oh, so, <laughs> um, you know, so handful, right? other records that you might want to think about, right? There are vital records available. There's religious denominations. And I would encourage you to look at all of the records in the area and the time frame that you think your ancestor is from, even if you don't think it's appropriate, right? So look at the Catholic record collection, even if you think they were Presbyterian. Look at the Quaker records, even if you think they were Catholic, because you you honestly just never know. You might be surprised. And it's best to just kind of look at that collection and if nothing else, just check it off the list and kind of get it out of the way. So you know you've done exhaustive research. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely look at military records, land and property, taxes was, of course, a huge influence on, on Ireland. Um, you know, everybody taxed everybody for everything. Um, but specifically when, you know, when England was controlling the Ireland, Isle, uh, Island, ugh, I messed that sentence up, um, you know, there were a lot of taxes. There were a lot of taxes applied. You definitely want to do surname clusters and surname research. Um, and then for sure, DNA, which we're not going to talk about too much, but DNA has been a huge door opener for, for Irish research. I can imagine. I Including can imagine. for myself, actually. Yeah. Um, hey, let me ask you a question when you talk about the checking other religious denominations, because that makes absolute sense because I know typically 
um, Irish immigrants into America, you know, were Irish, were um, Catholic or Protestants, kind of how we think. And then, of course, you yeah. mentioned the Quaker. Um, but that makes a lot of sense to to check those other denominations because for, you know, one of the, the things I, that can happen is the ancestor can end up in a spot. They may be Catholic, but what happens if they end up in a county that has no Catholic church available Catholic church, for them? Then right. what would they, so, you know, thank you for mentioning that because it definitely does kind of, it actually just kind of get, triggered a reminder for myself as I go to research, for instance, you know, my, my, opportunity to learn more ancestor um, <laughs> and, um, ended up in the foothills of North Carolina where, and I know what church she went to, but you know, she could have been Catholic for all I know, but there was no, there was no opportunity at all in that area to do, to go to a Catholic church. So, right. um, so that's, yeah, thank you for that. That's definitely a good help. And you definitely, you also want to look at, you know, keep in mind too, that you no know, online site has everything, right? Find My Past has the largest Irish collection available today, but there's still a lot of work to do. So, um, you know, I'm, I've am i been trying for a year and a half or so to get my hands on the records collection at Cornell University in New York, um, because they have records of a traveling Methodist minister across the state of New York, which, which was then like the wilds of New York, right? Um, and, and I need to check that book to see if my ancestors are in there. I'm not totally confident they're going to be, but it's one of the things on my research list that I need to check off my list to make sure that I've covered my bases, right? So look right. for those kind of outlying situations as well. Um, you know, one of my favorite collections, and I mentioned it earlier, actually, one of my favorite collections is the dog license register. So I'm going to plop that up really quick. Let me scroll over and find it just because it's such a fun scenario, right? Right. Um, 1,200 individual registers, over 6 million names out of Ireland includes addresses, occupations of the owners. The, the register, uh, the, the purpose for the dog license was to actually just fund the court system, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at these records, that's a genealogy document. It's oh. got a location. It's got a date. It's got... Um, a, uh, the name of the person, right? In this case, you see detail, the tax they paid or the, the fee for the license. You get a description of the dog, which I don't know any other record that will offer that to you. And in this case, this clerk also recorded the name of the dog. That is good. That I love that's that. good stuff, that, right? I mean, like, <laughs> and that's the level, but you know what? That is the level when we we're talking about getting to know those ancestors. Do you know what the name of the dog was? I mean, that's, that's the right? level we're right? talking about. Yeah. yeah. Really. Um, I wish I had ancestors in this particular area of Ireland. So I knew the name of the dog. I don't, of course. Do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, and not every page is going to have the name of the dog, but it's, I mean, what a great Thanksgiving story, right? Like, oh, our ancestors were back in Ireland and their dog's name was, you know, Bill or whatever. And he was a German <laughs> shepherd. Right? Like, that's, that's really cool. I um, do like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so so this type of document was really, you know, it's not a genealogical document in nature, but it helps us and it collects that fee. Well, what did it pay for? It paid for courts. It paid for for the court system to exist. Um, and so we need to be looking at all of the various um, um, court records that are available in Ireland. Um, and there are a lot of them. Um, we'll show an example from the landed estates court records. These are landowners who were traditionally British, um, but they owned property in Ireland. They were going bankrupt, right? Because the Irish economy was failing. Um, and so they established this court system to bail out the landlords. It started in 1848 and it lists the tenants year by year. Well, if you have Irish relatives, they were probably a tenant. Right. So when you look at the detail, I'm going to zoom in on this one um, um, and look at what you see in this. So the lease on this particular entry is dated 1800, the 1st of May, 1800. Now remember, these records start in 1848. So this is at least 48 years of history. Right. Okay. They have two houses on this on these two acres of land. There is a William Kearney and his brother, Joseph. There is another Joseph who is son of William. Um, and then you have the said Joseph, son of the said Lisey William, right? So that's at least two generations of the family. And then William is the only surviving member left. So everybody else mentioned in this document died at some point between 1800 and 1848 estimate, mm -hmm. right? When this record was taken. So 
you have this incredible description. No one would expect to find biographical like lineage information in landed estate records, but right. here it is, right? Um, and the court system and the the taxing and the all of these kind of materials from from the government are really crucial in Irish research. Um, so let me go one better even and give you an example from my own family. Um, the prison records are absolutely amazing. Now, I, I, we have a colleague, Ellie and I have a colleague, Brian Donovan. Some of you may have seen him on this uh, stream before and various Find My Past events. Um, he once told me that if anybody in the world competes with America in terms of taking each other to court, it's the Irish. <laughs> they sued each other for everything. So in the in the prison records, you're going to find criminal and civil courts, but they're mostly civil. There's 600 courts, 22 million records starting in 18. The court was established in 1827, but mandatory record records started in 1851. So at least 1851 through 1912, 22 million records. And you have images, but then every name is indexed. So if your ancestor was a witness to a crime, his name is going to, you're going to find him in the search, right? When you search for, for someone wow. in this session, in this, in these records. So let's take a look at one example from the petty courts. This is from County Wexford. And you've got um, in this one set, let's see my little, yeah. So at the top, um, you've got a road disturbance. Someone let their pigs wander into the street and they took them, their neighbors took them to court. Um, you've got a drunk and disorderly. And then you've got a dog that was found without a license. And then you've got a violent stabbing. That's all in one day in the County Wexford courts. <laughs> oh, and there was more, right? It's not the only page, but think about all of the opportunity. Every one of these has a complainant and a defendant. Most of them have some kind of a witness or um, some kind of you know statement from someone in the community. Um, testifying on behalf of one of the other parties. Um, it's an incredible resource, right? There's so mm -hmm. many people here. And again, you've got a name, a date, and a place. So now from here, you go, you've got at least a county. You can go into parish registers um, and some of the other information to see if you can pinpoint that family member. Right, right. And you can also, within that, you know, it speaks to the fan, you know, if, Absolutely. if you're suing each other or, you know, if he's upset because the pig got into his, you know, <laughs> And he probably lived pretty close. So you start to pick up on who, you know, who was around just because we talk about the fan club, the friends, associates, neighbors. I mean, yep. it didn't necessarily have to be a positive relationship there. <laughs> right. But it's some kind of relationship. Right, right. Um, yeah. So then we get to um, Archibald McKenzie, who is my uh, fourth great grandfather, um, who pleaded guilty of rioting. Uh, he was discharged on April 15th, 1846. He was held in the Cork prison, which was the picture I showed you a minute ago. Um, and for a while, I didn't realize the importance of the name underneath him, John Connell. But when I connect this particular record to his, hang on, I'm scrolling, to his newspaper where I find mention of the riot, I realized that they were in on this together. Archibald McKenzie and John Connell were charged with riot together. And they served their time together. They shared a cell together. That's my fan research right there, right? Mm -hmm. I need to know a lot more about John Connell. Yes, yes. I was going to say, I would see. And, and again, because you found him in the prison, definitely the next step when it comes to your, in your research process is, is head to the newspapers and see Absolutely. what else you can find out about that. Yeah. And, and actually I'm still looking. Um, I would, my colleagues and I, my Irish colleagues and I were just talking about this yesterday and trying to determine exactly where this little village is located and, and then trying to pinpoint where the newspapers are because um, unfortunately they've not yet been digitized yet. We don't think so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So more, more research to do. There's just so much opportunity. Now we think about, Ireland is, you know, not having a lot of records, but when you really think about some of these big um, record sets, right, you're really getting a lot of information. Um, the Catholic parish registers is another great example. Now, I'm going to just make sure everybody's aware these are free on Find My Past forever to search um, because they're just so important. These images were put online um, by the National Library of Ireland back in 2015, and both Find My Past and Ancestry provided an index and made them searchable. Um, we kind of did that in collaboration, partly. Uh, there are 7 million baptism records mm -hmm. over a 1,000 parishes. Um, so these are crucially important, but remember that every baptism probably has at least four adults named. It has 
in most cases, has the mother, the father, and two witnesses. So you have the opportunity to research from a variety of standpoints, right? Um, and that's why that index process was so very important for these records. The other thing is the condition of the records is not that great. These were taken from microfilm. Um, so some of them are quite difficult to read. Um, and so you see right away, right, that the need for an index was really clear, um, which is why we, we worked with Ancestry to make that available. That's right. Now, some of those, I guess, uh, people need to realize too, is that they might be in um, Latin, but not. Don't yes. be, don't be intimidated by that because it's actually. Um, I got into some of those with the Latin, and it was really quite easy to to figure it out. Plus, you mm -hmm. can, plus there are, and I think I found it on the Find My Past blog at some point was like a, a list, like a um, what I call a word list. I think yep. for Latin for common Latin terms used in, in the records. So yep. that's really helpful if you, you print one off and just have it sitting beside you. Uh, absolutely. Um, Ellie, looks like Ellie's going to find that for us and share the link. Um, we had we do have a couple of blog posts actually about Latin and the Catholic records. Um, and actually, so I found um, a couple of weeks ago, I was working on uh, transcribing a record from the Baltimore collection, the Archdiocese of Baltimore collection. And I hadn't seen that terminology. There's that link. Thank you so much, Ellie, for sharing yes, that in the comments. Um, I, I hadn't seen that exact terminology before, so I did my best to transcribe it. Um, I then went to Google Translate and pumped it into that just to see what, what popped out. And then I emailed the archivist and I said, hey, do you think this is correct? Did I, did I get this right? And she emailed me back right away. Um, they're not unhelpful people, right? They're really, really willing to, to contribute to the, the wealth of knowledge that's out there. And especially if they've digitized their records with a, you know, with an organization like Find My Past, um, they're particularly interested in making sure that people have success in utilizing the records and that they translate it correctly. So don't be afraid to reach out to the archive in question, um, whether it's a religious archive or a state organization or a national organization, feel free. I mean, that's what those people are for. So, um, you know, take advantage of that part of the community as well. Absolutely. Because it is important to know, it's one thing to find your ancestor listed in the record, but make sure you're not leaving valuable information to your research unrecognized because yeah. it could be, you know, it, understand. you want to make sure you're understanding what you're reading and what it really means. And I think that's so, so important, particularly when you're researching in records of another country is so important to make sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Reach out to the archivist and um, they, they are more than, I mean, that's what they're there for. And they love, they love their work. They love. Yeah. Them, so, yeah. And and that's a really good point, Lisa, is, is understanding the context of the article or the, the record. Um, and that's, you know, I keep saying these aren't genealogy records by nature, but that's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. You just said it better than I did. Um, mm -hmm. That, you know, they weren't originally created to be genealogical or historical documentation of any kind, but now, of course, they are. So um, it's a really important that you understand the context of what you're looking at. And when you are researching a, a place that's new to you or an international location, understanding the basic history of that location is important as well, right? We get a lot of questions that find my past, of course, about what records do we have for Northern Ireland? Ooh, well, yeah. that's an important question, but put it in context first. Northern Ireland wasn't a thing until actually quite recently. When you think about the scope of Irish history, um, that's a relatively new creation. Um, so while we do have records for Northern Ireland, and I'm going to share a new one with you in just a second, um, most of our collection for Ireland is actually all of Ireland, because the records were created before Northern Ireland existed. Mm -hmm. um, so just this last month, actually, we released a brand new set that is specific to Northern Ireland. This is the Belfast and Ulster directories. We're especially excited about these. Um, this is in cooperation with the North of Ireland Family History Society. So we thank them for their partnership. Um, the directory started publication in 1890, and they were annual publications um, up to that point, or you know, as starting in 1890. And it covers the period when Ireland transitions into two different countries, and you kind of have the creation of 
Northern Ireland, right? Um, mm -hmm. So generally, uh, for, for those of you who are familiar with North American directories, it includes some of the kind of similar information, right? You're going to get some of that information about civil establishments, the street directory in some cases. Um, for most of these, it's Belfast only. You might get the residence list for larger communities, but you're certainly going to get the trade and professional directory component and then an occupation um, and address of those individuals. But it's important to think about, oh, and I have a flashy little thing. Yay, it's new. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's important to realize, of course, that, you know, this is this is a tumultuous period, right, in Irish history. So when you break down the context of the publication itself, right, before you even start looking at the records, think about the history of the publication. And all of this is available in the information on Find My Past. If you read all the context, all the contextual information that we offer on the site, that's where you get all this. So from 1890 to 1921, it was the Belfast and Province Ulster, uh, excuse me, Belfast and Province of Ulster Directory covered all of the nine Northern counties. 1923, we start to see that transition, right? So it changes its name and it starts to just publish the Province of Northern Ireland. So it dropped the three of the counties that are now part of the Irish Free State. 1948, it changes its name again. And of course, you know, at this point, they've had their civil war, right? So it's the Belfast and Northern Ireland directory. They drop Ulster from the name, right? And that's an important distinction because politically, that would have been an important move for them, right? Culturally, that was an important thing to do. And keep in mind, of course, that this is developed with OCR technology. So you want to make good use of your wild cards, that little asterisk symbol in your search. Um, think about the fact that four names are often abbreviated. So instead of searching for William, search for WM. Um, and the publication was firmly unionist and it is reflected in the material. So you know, bear in mind that when you approach a search or research in some of these publications, you have to understand the context so you know what is going to be included and what's not going to be included, which may be really important to your research plan. Absolutely. Absolutely. Understanding what it can tell you, but also understanding what it cannot tell you is, is right. just as important. Yep. So when you look at these records, it, it, it appears, you know, like a pretty typical register. But one of the things that I found interesting and a little bit different from the directories I'm used to in North America is that it's got some of that gazetteer style information. Instead mm -hmm. of having it all in the front of the publication, which is where I think most U.S. directories put it, it's in the pages. It's mixed in with these little county profile or community profiles. So mm -hmm. if we zoom in on this a little bit, you see that it's got information about the post office, the local military unit, um, the schools, all the churches are listed, the banks. Um, Oh, what else was on here that I thought was really interesting? Oh, the golf club. It even lists the local golf club. So if if there are records for this community that exist, they exist from these institutions, right? These are the places that created paperwork. Mm -hmm. So these are the places you go to for additional research. And then you yeah. go into and look at, you know, I mean, realize this is a really small community, right? The entire population of the community that they listed is in less than one page, right? A page and a half, maybe, because the names start down here. Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, kind of. And then the names end right there, right? So it's it's a very small community, but it's worth noting that all of that information is listed out for us. Um, the rest of the pages are pretty typical, right? In the large cities, you're going to see kind of exactly what you're used to seeing in directories. But this collection is, you know, like I said, brand new and only available on Find My Past and, um, and well worth it if you're looking into Northern Ireland counties. Oh, absolutely. The, the city directories um, and, and, and any type of directory is such, I think it's an underused tool by genealogy researchers. Absolutely. It, it absolutely, you know, you're looking for the names, but the, as you just pointed out, there is so much, there's so much social history in a directory. Oh um, so you know, that if you go back, like, can you go back to the slide where it was just like you were showing the communities, the, that little community? And I, I can't, I, I can't read all that too well, but a lot of times when you find something like a community, in this case, you know, it's listing out this post office and the school, but you might also find things like churches. So yeah. that can help you locate a closer, a church closest to your ancestor. It might list out, um, this is an American example, but things like temperance societies, yes. you know, some of those kinds of things. And if you're really lucky, it'll put like the officers or it might put the church or it might put the organization's members listed. Mm -hmm. And so you can place, again, learning it, it, 
it tells you what was important to your ancestor from like their causes, their social causes. Perhaps, Absolutely. Yep. That might have been there. It is a way to find women. Oh so gosh. Yes. Feel, you know, particularly if you're, you know, if it's a women's organization and they maybe make, you know, fingers crossed, they put all of them in there, but typically it's more, if they include names, it's typically going to be maybe the women who helped, you know, the people who held the offices. But again, um, if you can find them there and then you, you know, are they listed as miss or are they listed as Mrs. Mrs. Right. All of those kinds of little things that you can pick up. It's, it's subtle, but really when you really? find a good directory, you know, and this is a such a wonderful example, really sit with it. Don't do the grab your ancestor and run kind of thing. Really spend yeah. time on that, that yeah. record. I'm so glad that you brought up women's organizations, Lisa, we have to do a session on social history. We just have to. So I um, I literally turned around and, and pulled this off my shelf and I got this at a used bookstore a few years ago. It's Cincinnati Club Women's Register from 1938 to 39. Now I know today's topic is Ireland, but when you look at the pages of a directory like this, it's so specific, right? You get pages and pages and hopefully you guys can see some of that. Um, it's just all women, all women, and they're yeah. almost all listed as misses, right? But when mm -hmm. you read off, right, you've got, um, Seventh Presbyterian Church Missionary and Sewing Societies, Cincinnati League of the Heart of Heart and Heart of Hearing, I, and I, apparently Heart of Reading too, um, Board <laughs> Member and Chairman of Ways and Means Committee, right? We've got the PTA in here. We've got Three Arts Club. We've got, oh. American Irish Women of Cincinnati. Look at that. Yeah. What do you know? What on you page know um, 18. So these are the resources that are going to open up our research, right? And so if you're if you're thinking broadly and you're thinking um, from a, I like to say from a 30,000 foot view and looking down on the planet, well, where are you connecting the dots? Um, and these are the types of resources that all of us need to be need to be grasping and, mm -hmm. and trying to find. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're I looking for books, <laughs> yeah, if you're looking for books like that too, you can do things like, um, I mean, you can do a Google search like through Google books or mm -hmm. WorldCat. Yeah. WorldCat is, is another great, great way to look for some of those more obscure books that might not, you know, how do you know to search for a book that you don't know exists yet? So you can use those key terms, keywords in those, in Google Books and, and WorldCat to start finding some of those things. Because to find those here in North America, again, that can make the difference between identifying the county your ancestor came from in Ireland and not. Right. Yep. Yep, exactly. Um, and just recognizing we just have a few minutes left, I want to yeah. uh, make sure that people understand how to find the records for Ireland um, on the Find My Past site. Um, so keep in mind first that um, to see most of the records, you're gonna want to have a subscription, um, but to search the catalog, um, you do you need a free account, right? You need to register and find my pass. You don't necessarily need a subscription for everything. And as I've noted, a couple of our big collections are free, um, but, the main tool for actually locating records on Find My Past is our all record sets page. So think mm -hmm. of this as a combination of a card catalog and your favorite search engine kind of merged into one. So it lists all of our record sets, um, but we give you a lot of options as to how to filter this list so that you can find what you're interested in. So the first suggestion I have would be to just change that drop down menu for where it says where, just change it from world to Ireland. Um, the only time you won't have to do this is if you're actually accessing Find My Past from Ireland, it will automatically filter to the Irish record sets. But for the rest of the world, you'll have to change it to Ireland. And then what you get is this list of all the record sets across the site, whether they're Irish, American, Canadian, English, it doesn't matter where they originated. If they have some information in them about Ireland, they're going to be on this list. Um, so you see the people in the news comes up, you know, at the top of the list. So that's, that's um, 
little bits and details that we've pulled out of our newspaper collection and made them searchable online. Um, and it's usually vital events, right? Birth, marriage, death type information. Um, the British and Irish Roots collection we talked about earlier, uh, passengers list leaving the UK, right? Um, that's a huge record set for those of us who are um, in the British diaspora category. Um, and then you've got, you know, World War II allies. Well, that certainly going to have Irish people in it. Um, if you go down a little bit further, hopefully you guys can see the Victoria Inward Passenger List. That's an Australia record set, right? So, um, oh gosh, and of course my computer's trying to do an update right now. Are you kidding? Okay, so, um, uh, <laughs> all right, it's going all over the place. Okay, um, so keep in mind that just because we're looking for Irish information doesn't mean that we're just looking in Irish record sets, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the times we're going to be, but um, but you might find them elsewhere. Um, and then you can filter by any of those, um, the lists at the top, right? So record set, category, subcategory, or number of records. You can click on anything on that screen that's in that blue color and sort the list, whether it's alphabetically or by the number of records, whether that's a lot of records or a small number of records um, or the category or subcategory on Find My Past. You can also then filter down to a specific county. So if you happen to know that your ancestors were in County Waterford, for example, you can put that into the into the search and actually generate that list as well. Um, so every record that is now showing in the list will have some connection back to County Waterford. And if it doesn't include County Waterford, it's just gone from the list. Um, so you can also do this kind of generic search up at the top. Um, and, you know, I use that a lot when I'm going to a specific record set. So if I'm, if I'm specifically looking for the Irish Catholic records, I'll just type in the word Catholic and all of the Catholic um, uh, record sets and all the Catholic collections come up and populate in the list. And it's a, it's a one click from there. So that's the easiest way to get to the vast majority of records on Find My Past. Yeah, definitely. And that's, that's how I use them as well. Um, to kind of filter things out, definitely. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So a couple other things just to kind of quickly go through because we didn't really, we touched on census a little bit, but not in a lot of detail. So um, the, the, num the amount of information, of course, in the census is varied by year, just like it does everywhere else. Um, 1821 is quite early for starting a census, right? Um, it's earlier than, than England and Wales. Um, and of course, in the U.S., we started in 1790, but um, but in, in in the U.S., we started with tick marks. They didn't use tick marks in Ireland until 1831. So keep in mind, of course, that these are all fragments, right? There's not a lot surviving. And we talked about that, that record loss at the beginning. But just know what is possible and what's not possible in the census fragments that do still exist. Mm -hmm. um, so and. And as you go, as you work through the site, right, you can see a variety of examples and and how detailed they got or how undetailed they got, right? Um, they had this this one weird year where they kind of went into the tick marks and then came right back out into head of household again. Um, so as you work your way through the census fragments, you eventually get to the 1901, 1911, which is the full, you know, that's what, you know, the full first full years of Irish census. And look at all the information that you can get. It's very similar to um, UK census or to uh, North American census, but um, again, just a really, really important um, piece of information. So all that fan research that you're doing, all those other names that you're collecting, you need to absolutely make sure that you are um, applying those names to your census research as well. Yeah, definitely. I absolutely. Yeah. Always knowing what they'll tell you. And, you, you know, usually when you're searching, you know, when you're searching, you can, it'll tell you when you pull up that database, it'll tell you, usually there's a section at the bottom that says, this Absolutely. is what, and these are other suggestions. And always read that first. You can save yourself a ton of time because if you're looking for a piece of information and it's not included in that record, you there's no reason to, to go through all that process and then find out later that it was never there to start with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so just a couple of basics, you know, census research, 
census research suggestions. Um, each collection on Find My Pass, each of the years has its own dedicated search page with specific search fields. So keep that in mind um, as you're working through the census collection on Find My Past. The search fields might change from year to year um, or that, you know, the fragment section from 1821 to 1851. It allows you to search for things like other members of the household, right, which is suggestion number two. So um, if the fragment if if it's torn or damaged or whatever or, or doesn't exist and you have a brother's name or someone else in the household search for that person because maybe that's the name we were able to index um, versus you know head of household right so uh so keep that in mind do a lot of broad open-minded searches um and especially in ireland i think most people did not really know their birth year um, so we've calculated age based on the year offered in the census um, but those names and ages can really vary, right? And one of my lines, uh, actually the guy that went to jail, he said he was, I don't remember the exact ages, but I'll just use an example. He said he was 50 in one census and the next census he was like 72. Um, so obviously that's not correct, but I think it just really boils down to the fact that he just didn't know when he was born, right? Um, he didn't know what year he was born. Um, and so he just kind of guessed and he made it up. So do you think the ages, the age variations are, are more significant in the Irish census as opposed to the American census records? In my experience, yes, that's true. Okay. Um, I'm it's sure cool. that there are examples on either extreme of that, but mm -hmm. um, from what I've, f the work that I've done, yes, I think they're more extreme in Ireland. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, you know, fill in the gaps, right? Use a lot of these 19th century census substitutes. And there are more than we've had time to cover, but use everything that you can find to really fill in those gaps on the census and try and, you know, if you, if you build a research plan and you think about the questions they asked on the census, those are the same questions you should put in your research plan. What's mm -hmm. your name? Who's your spouse? When were you born? Um, are you male or female, right? Are you, you know, all the basics. What's your occupation? What's your religion? Um, because we don't have those census, census pages to rely on anymore. We have to fill in those pieces of information um, ourselves, right? So, right? so whatever question they asked on the census, you should be asking in your, in your research plan at some point. Absolutely. 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 Yeah. Nice. Wow, Jen, you've given. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <lost> <laughs> <there now. laughs> um, and you know, when all else fails, reach out to the local societies, the local family history organizations, the archives, the libraries. The National Library of Ireland is fantastic. Their website's amazing, mm -hmm. right? Is. Always fall back to the community, to that you know that that group of people that really are here to help us, right? And that includes the Find My Pass family, right? If you're struggling with something on Find My Pass, send us an email um, and I will, or, or connect with us on Facebook or Twitter or, you know, whatever your favorite platform is. Um, you can always reach us. And, and these are our UK addresses and our UK phone number, but we also have um, North American contacts as well. So just findmypass.com instead of .co.uk. Um, but, you know, reach out to us. We're always really happy to help. Yep. And feel free to, you know, you can always message me. I'm a, obviously I'm a, um, at least listen.com as well as on Facebook as well. And we'd love to have yeah, you. Absolutely. Yeah, check all that out. Definitely. Um, um, so a little teaser and I know Ellie's got these links ready for us if she hasn't shared them already, but make sure you're looking at the find my past blog. We have a County by County record guide for Ireland. Um, the British newspaper archive is um, our sister site um, and fantastic newspaper research, um, really great tools that we don't necessarily have on Find My Pass. So use both, but they have a blog post specific to Irish newspapers for genealogy research. And then our YouTube channel has a couple of really good sessions, but the one I'm going to point out is Brian Donovan's Irish family history is easy. No, seriously. Um, please take the time to watch that because he goes really in depth in some of the history and um, some of the record loss and, and the legalities behind everything. So it's, it's really good contextual information. And then just to tease everybody, uh, we have more directories and more newspapers from Ireland coming soon in the next couple of months. So um, watch out for that as well. Make sure you're on our email list as well as Lisa's email list to get yes. all of yes. the best new information. And I will let you guys know as soon as I know when they're here, I will definitely <laughs> link you guys out to that too. Cause that's always exciting to do. Yes. Um, yep, I love those directories. Woo. So yeah, well, thank you. you so much, Jen. Oh my gosh. This has been amazing. I actually, I'm like, Oh, 
I'm ready to, you know, I'm really ready to dig into <laughs> my Irish, my Irish research more because I, I mean, I, I pick it up and I put it down. I pick her up and put it down, you know, and again, I'm still here in North America on, on this particular ancestor, but I now have some ideas and some clues and some ways to, um, move this forward. And also I've made notes you, over here about things that people that I might need to speak to or groups I might, you know, who I can maybe reach out to, to learn more about her life in this particular area um, kind of thing. So yeah, thank you so much for that. That really is such a help. Um, and I hope everybody else has had a chance to learn as well. Um, I know there was a lot of discussion going over on the Facebook groups. I could see it over there. So we will absolutely yeah. have to, um, um, I'm, I'll be going through some of the comments too to help in, in responding as well. They were flying by. So um, yeah, thank you so much, yeah, Jen. And Jen and I will actually be doing another one of these probably next month, I think it is, on, on the Catholic record. Yes, so that's right. Super excited about that one as well. So there's a teaser for you. Just yeah. <laughs> um, So it'll be on my Facebook group and in my newsletter, guys. So you're welcome. I'll be sure you guys know about that. So yeah. Anything else, Jen, you want to add? You know, I think um, I think my, my closing comment would be some of this feels kind of like really intense, heavy research. Um, and, and that can be really true. Um, you know, we made that comment a couple of times, but don't forget to have a good time as well. Genealogy is a lot of fun and family history should be fun. So let yourself play around on the websites a little bit. Let yourself explore some of these records that you've never used before. Um, take the time to look at the Irish dog license registers just because they're cool, right? And 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 give yourself the chance to just explore and have a good time. And don't forget that while it can be frustrating, um, we never have a brick wall. We only have opportunities to learn and, and let yourself just have a good time with it. That's my suggestion. Uh, excellent advice. Yes. Have a good time with it and know that every research piece of research you do, whether you find your answer or not, is still just valuable to you yeah. and you still have something from that. So um, thank you guys so much for yes. joining us. I am super excited you guys were able to, um, be a part of this. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you, Jen, for having me and find my pass for hosting our um, Facebook Live today. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. We're really looking forward to next month as well, Lisa. So thank you very much for your time and expertise. No problem. All right, guys. All right. Well, have a good day, everyone. And we will see you next month. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.